Good afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started. We have a very packed agenda today, um, but I, I do thank in advance a few of our committee chairs who have um, found a way not to have a report. So maybe that'll help us move through a little bit quicker. Um, the meeting of February 5th, WVU Faculty Senate will now come to order. The minutes of the January 8th Faculty Senate meeting have been distributed as a link in your agenda. Are there any corrections or additions to the January minutes? Great. Hearing none, the minutes are approved and will be posted by, as written, and will be posted by Corey. The next item is my report. And um, I'd like to start by letting you know a little bit uh, about the BOG Ad Hoc Governance Committee that I had told you about last month. We've now had our first meeting on January the 25th. We've got another meeting coming up next week, and I think this process is going to move along fairly quickly. The, the meeting was held in executive session, so I, I can't report any details yet, but I can tell you there's a, a pretty aggressive timeline being considered as far as these, this preliminary piece, and I think you'll have some information um, before we um, leave for summer break in, in late spring. The, um, our next meeting, like I said, is September, I mean, is February the 15th. Um, so, and relative to the faculty senate activities with regard to the impending presidential search, Beginning today, you'll hear from Scott Wayne and um, or uh, Stan Heilman, who are working on shared governance and leading the effort relative to the faculty senates and the faculty's involvement on this side um, with the presidential search. So Scott will be reporting out at every meeting from, from here on out as a regular committee report to update us on their efforts. The University p and Advisory Panel has now been seated, and um, thanks to Chris, he worked very diligently on this, and, and we worked together and have come up with now the following faculty members. Thomas Bias, Cheryl Chisholm, Mark Fullen, Stephanie Hines, Margaret James, Christopher Latuma, Courtney Mancini, Margaret Miltenberger, Scott Myers, Angela Peterson, Kristen Chop, Cindy Trickett Shockey, Lori Sherlock, David Smith, Carrie Woodbury, and Tom Finney. And thank you to all of you who volunteered. Thank you for um, beating the bushes for us, um, for faculty to serve on this important activity. The executive committee is responsible for appointing this panel and did vote to do so at the last meeting. The initial work to draft the revised p &T, uh, university p and document is now underway. Um, and as I reported last month, after the initial pass is complete, the draft will go to faculty welfare, which will review and provide feedback to further refine the draft as needed and then to establish processes for uh, broad faculty input from across the university. And again, we anticipate completing that draft with faculty welfare by the end of this semester with the idea that next fall and probably into spring, depending on what the committee comes up with, will be the time for a variety of methods for faculty input and discussion. And if all goes well, a vote late next spring to, um, to establish the new document. <clears throat> As Scott and I have previously mentioned, both mentioned, We've been leaning very heavily on our faculty senate constitution over the past several years. And through that process, some, um, some omissions, some weaknesses, some cracks, if you will, have been revealed through those stress tests. So we had, in the past four years, we've had COVID, we've had the first attempt at passing the university p and document, and now we've had ac everything involved with academic transformation. And that's a, that's a long list of things that we've, um, had to lean on the Constitution for. And so through that time, we started keeping a list of things that at some point we might like to circle back to, to strengthen that document for our purposes so that we don't have as much um, ambiguity or um, 
you know, difficulty figuring out what to do when these type of, of uh, more intense things happen. So um, we've um, initiated a process to look at revising the Constitution. And we, we're going to do it much like we're doing with the PNT document in a four-step process. The first step being a subcommittee of exec from vo uh, volunteers from exec who are going to make a first pass at it based on this list of potential changes, things that came out that were of concern. Um, then once that happens, uh, the draft will be delivered to shared governance. Shared governance will then review and provide feedback on the draft, developing recommendations also for a process and timeline again for uh, broad faculty uh, feedback and work on the document in the fall and hopefully with a vote in late next spring. So a lot, a lot's in motion. Uh, but, but we think that'll be a very um, helpful process for us and for, for future leadership as they try to guide us through these different processes that unfold. Um, regarding the um, university's uh, leadership's progress on the non-academic area reviews, Last Friday, Tanya Willis-Miller and I were presented again with a batch of detailed outcomes of reviews of non-academic areas. This time we heard, I reported last time we had heard 11 at our previous meeting. This time we heard 25 uh, reviews from, of 25 departments from health sciences, the research office, student life, and university relations. So we're, we've now got um, 26 of these uh, department level reviews. The presentations again included approaches and inputs to the reviews, uh, activity descriptions, outcome metrics, personnel rosters, budgets, and where, avail where available con uh, comparisons to industry ben benchmarks. And not all department level activities have industry benchmark comparisons available, but where they were, they were presented. So again, the results of these reviews, along with all the other non-academic areas of the university will be presented to BOG um, on February 22nd, 23rd, and subsequently to you on March 4th at the faculty senate meeting. And we expect to post um, something on the faculty senate website. Uh, what, where we're sort of headed, I think, is that hopefully there will be some sort of synopsis of each one but then perhaps we'll be able to post the actual detailed reviews as well. So there's going to be a lot of information available on the non-academic areas. It's looking like, I think what we thought, some things will stay the same. Some things are, are likely going to be recommended for some investment. Some things are, are, um, are in the process of being um, reduced, combined, et cetera. So much like our programs. Uh, our next Senate meeting is March the 4th, right here, and that concludes my report. Any questions for me? Then at this time, I'd like to recognize SGA Senator Garrett Ausler, um, who has an announcement. Hello, thank you for giving me your time. Um, I'm here to just let you all know that SGA wants to hold a roundtable discussion event with faculty senate members. Everybody is invited to come. Um, it will be February 19th from 4 to 6 p.m. in the Mountain Lair ballrooms. Um, we'll just, it's just a time to come and talk to the SGA members. Um, there will be discussions about um, recruitment, retention, sustainability, um, student, student rights, Etc. Like, there's a lot of different topics, and it. We tried to have one before, and you just like rotate around the different tables and come and talk and and meet SGA members. So I think it would be a great time to. We would love to meet you all and talk more in depth on different things. So, thank you again for the time. Thank you, Garrett. Um, we will. Could you questions for Garrett? Thank you. We'll send out an, an announcement on that like we did before. And, and Garrett, I apologize to you all. I, I didn't realize this was a working session for the first one. 
And so we use the term mixer, and I don't know if maybe that didn't quite get the traction you were hoping for. I also appreciate that you're doing this at 4 instead of at 6.30. I think maybe a little more likely some of us might, might be able to make it. So we will send that out. If you are chair of a committee or on a committee that's one of their topics, I encourage you to try and stop by if you can. Okay, this time um, we'll hear from Cindy Trickett-Shockey, Chair of Curriculum Committee. Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, bring before the group a report of the committee that met in January. At that time, we did seven program reviews, five program changes, two were for new programs. We also uh, uh, did a complete review of those and found that most of these were coming from transformation. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing what the product that they produce. Uh, we also have under Annex 1, we had new courses. There were 24 courses that were reviewed. Uh, they passed the acid test for our committees. So we are uh, looking for that to be approved, along with the 53 course changes that you found in Annex 2. So I would like to entertain a motion for these to be approved. Very well. So we will bundle the program changes, new programs, new courses report, and course changes report into a single votable item. Are there any questions or discussion for Cindy on Annex 1, Annex 2, or the change to new programs? Very well. All those in favor of approving Annex 1, Annex 2, the changed in new programs, please raise your hands. Very well. Please lower your hands. All those opposed, please raise your hands. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. And we do have Annex 3 for you to peruse. There were 13 courses that were discontinued. Thank you. And I don't think this has come up before, but since you alluded to it, just, just to clarify, all of the changes that were recommended out of academic transformation in the program reviews are coming through the normal process. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, next report is from Mary Beth Angeline, but I understand she does not have a report today. Is that, yeah, there you are. Okay, thank you, Mary Beth. And now we'll hear from Marina Galvez Peralta, Chair of Teaching and Assessment Committee, and I believe she's online. Okay, and I'm gonna share her document. We lost our PDF. Would you prefer for me to share from here? Yeah. Okay. I think she's got it. Okay. Okay, I got it. Okay, so thank you so much uh, for having time uh, for me to share the efforts that uh, the Teaching and Assessment Committee have been um, dedicated uh, dedicating for the last uh, three years. Um, uh, I was reached out by the executive in the Senate to um, kind of explain and give um, a little bit of um, feedback on why we are proposing these changes on the student uh, uh, survey um, at the end of the semester. Uh, if you remember, for those of you who were here on the, la on the last meeting, I provide a little of the feedback of the why, the reason. So today we are going to be focusing more on what the new instrument is. And um, after 2022, we, uh, it was proposed that uh, some schools we pilot. So the goal is for the next meeting, faculty senate meeting, we will come back with uh, sharing some of the, the lessons learned from this pilot. So again, for those of you um, who were not able to attend or didn't have access to this um, uh, handout, um, just uh, as a refreshment, that we really need a culture shift um, on the student's evaluation, uh, that we already have that need, that students' evaluations are not helpful. Peer institutions and um, 
scholarly, scholarly of teaching and learning are sharing that those students' evaluations have a lot of bias um, and usually affecting a faculty of minority, uh, faculty with accent, faculty, uh, female faculty, or or um, uh, foreigners as well. So we wanted to look forward. What do we need in the new instrument? As I shared last last uh, in the last faculty meeting, so we did um, uh, perform a literature evaluation. We realized that one fit uh, one side doesn't fit all. That we need to have some cores, and then we see and explore all the different institutions that are either appear or aspirational. Um, to see what they are doing currently. And surprisingly for us, all of them are shifting gears. The same thing that TACO is proposing on doing is to shift that evaluation word, to take it away, to basically is student feedback, and also uh, to have a different type of instrument and that I will explain. So one of the uh, common things that we found was that there is no Likert scale, so it's not from one to five. It is going to be a three scale is useful, not useful, or is neutral. As well as find a way of having that um, accountability and taking the student, uh, sharing with the students that this is something that is relevant at the same time that they have to be professional and not attacking the faculty. So the new instrument, um, either SPOT or SPD, the student perception of teaching, if you realize we are changing the word, we are not using evaluation, the students cannot evaluate the faculty. Uh, so it's basically uh, sharing with us uh, their their perception or how things are being helping have, helping on their learning. Again, we are we are thinking about uh, brand, you know, changing the name or making a different uh, way um, of reaching out to the students. So again, um, we are looking for having a more holistic evaluation of uh, or feedback of the faculty. Um, together with that new PNT document that uh, it was mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning of the Faculty Senate, uh, we, this will be one of the tools, not the unique tool that the faculty have to document and to share examples of their um, continuous improvement in their teaching. And hopefully uh, this new instrument, it will help us to also provide a more impartial way of providing feedback. What is helping, what is not helping? At the same time, it's beneficial for faculty to see what actually worked or didn't work and have that um, um, framework of scholarly teaching. So basically change and adapt based on the different um, student needs. So this is going to be the instrument uh, that it is being already piloted. And what we decide was to have some of the questions are going to be mandatory questions. So they will be always there. And they are going to be addressing different areas of their the teaching. So if you notice on the first one, the manner in which concepts were presented was, and you can see it's going to be only beneficial, neutral, or uh, not helpful. Basically, we are going to be uh, addressing um, kind of the traditional, like how is the instructor presenting the concepts. On the second question that is going to be mandatory is going to be class discussions were helpful or neutral or not helpful. Again, is is focusing more on what happened during the class time. Do we have uh, dynamic interactions? The third one will be the ability of the instructor to adapt to different learners. So basically it is um, addressing whether or not uh, the instructor is able to interact with different students with different backgrounds. The fourth one is addressing feedback, right? More and more, we know that, uh, especially in these new generations, students need more feedback and more um, uh, rapid and quickly feedback. If, if we don't provide feedback, they think that they are doing everything fantastic. So basically in this question, we are trying to assess uh, or give the opportunity for the student to share whether or not uh, the feedback was appropriate, it was timely, and if there was any opportunity. And last one, of course, it has to be with technology because we are going to be independently, independently if we are in the classroom or if we are asynchronous or um, synchronous online, we will depend on those. So basically it's kind of providing that feedback. Okay, so those are the, the, the five mandatory questions that we are proposing that all surveys may have.
Now, we understand that some faculty may want to ask more questions or go more in depth on those categories. So um, you can see, uh, now I'm going to be coming up again with the same category question. The first one on the top, it is the mandatory question that we said is going to be bolded. And then we have other elective uh, uh, questions that you may see at the bottom that are going to be uh, in, in, in cursive, in italic. So in this case, when we are talking about um, uh, the way that the concepts are addressed in the classroom, um, faculty may want to also include this question, clarification of important points. In the question of the class discussion, um, if it's appropriate, maybe the faculty may want to ask about the length, right? Do, do we have enough time? Do we block enough time in the classroom for this, this uh, class discussion? On the third one, adapting to individual learners, maybe the uh, faculty want to dive more into changes on instructional approaches. Um, maybe the faculty was able to provide um, or offer a um, mid-term uh, um, feedback and basically is adapting um, uh, from the feedback of that uh, cohort of students or whether or not the faculty kind of show or express any kind of concern for particular students if they are learning or they are getting lost. Feedback to students. Uh, here we came up with a few questions, right? Because when we are giving feedback, it could be that the feedback itself is helpful. Maybe the feedback it is um, is not giving at the right time, right? So are we giving at the right time? Um, are we having the opportunity to give feedback, maybe in assignments? Maybe it is uh, it is something that a faculty is usually doing for the teaching. So again, we wanted to come up with different examples of possibilities that a faculty may be um, uh, using and that way it helps them to get feedback on those. And if you notice on the scale, all of them is, is helpful or is not helpful or is neutral. And in the last one was again, additional maybe technology in the classroom if a faculty is teaching. Um, in, um, in classroom or if they are using uh, online or they are uh, uh, doing any other additional um, activities, uh, what is the use of the media? Okay, so that is the overall, like, but we also agree that different uh, schools, different teaching modalities are going to be having different requirements to provide feedback, right? So that idea that I kind of glanced at the beginning that one size doesn't fit all, that is where we wanted to come up with options uh, for faculty that maybe are teaching in the laboratory setting or they are doing clinical courses or maybe they are doing service. So, um, so far in the um, pilot uh, survey, we have incorporating the laboratory and the, um, and the service learning. And then we are now working on trying to uh, come up with solutions for the clinical courses. So for the laboratory, basically, it is good, it's beneficial, neutral, not useful that expectations about the lab procedures or if the explanations were helpful uh, or the safety, right? Lab, lab safety was uh, were helpful. With clinical courses, we came up with a few um, suggestions. Again, we are working with uh, faculty that are teaching in the area to get more feedback. Um, again, we are trying to keep always a three category. It is going to be beneficial, neutral, or not useful or either agree, disagree, or neutral. For the service learning, it will be a similar approach. So is it whether or not that service learning is relevant to the learning of the student, if it has clear expectations, uh, if it was a good way of monitoring. So again, we are um, asking the student to either agree or disagree. And then for perfume, uh, performing arts and uh, studio, um, based on feedback from faculty in that area, uh, we decided that the best way to ask that question will be kind of an open-ended question of what did it help to learn in this course? Okay, so that is the instrument. Again, we are thinking, well, how can we still give that opportunity to, to students to provide um, a general feedback, right? So, I know all of us, when we have a survey, we always have an open text box where we are asking students what other comments you have, right? So based on the feedback and based on the literature that we have checked and other peer institutions, 
What we found was that the framework and the way we ask the student to provide that feedback matters. So the wording that we will be asking in that empty box of providing feedback, it will clarify that please provide constructive suggestions in terms of how this course could be changed to improve the learning. So again, that is going to be, um, I know it's the fear for faculty to say, oh, now they're going to be using this box to provide and vent and complain about maybe not just uh, myself as an instructor, but maybe things of the course that the instructor cannot control. So how can we minimize that? Well, the way that we found other institutions are doing is that they are providing clear guidance to the students of how, um, how this survey matters. What is the impact? Uh, basically, we have to tell them this is going to help uh, your learning. And then to be mindful about including only things that the instructor could have control over, right? If we have seven days of a snow day, the instructor doesn't have control over that. So we have to really clarify that to the students and also for them to be fair, right? Okay, so looking at wording, um, this is what we initially started with. Again, we are open uh, to feedback. It is um, kind of explaining to the student to please make sure to provide feedback on things that the instructor has control over. Um, and at the same time, we, saw, uh, we, we found that if you are bringing up to the framework of the values of the university, right? So we have the civility, the sensitivity, inclusivity, mutual respect that um, students may be more open to, to go in that direction, basically asking what did it help uh, uh, in your learning? And then um, we know that other schools have been using kind of like the thing that we have in the cursive it is basically for um, the students to read and recognize, yes, I know that this survey is going to be anonymous, but if I cross the line and I'm becoming non-professional or attacking the persona of a faculty, there could be a violation of professionalism and there could be consequences. Um, some other institutions actually, they make the student to say, yes, I agree, or to sign. Um, again, I, we don't know how we will be able to do that because the, you know, the survey has to be anonymous for the faculty, but I just want to share things that have been uh, offering other institutions. Okay, so that will be one option, right, of how we can foster that professional feedback and trying to help uh, the faculty to kind of gain uh, how is the class going, how are the new techniques that we are incorporating. Um, and then the other thing is, what do I do if I get a negative feedback? So um, despite all the fact of trying to train the students to say, please be mindful and be respectful, uh, we will be able to also have that uh, open um, um, request from faculty to, uh, to uh, redact a, a comment if the uh, comment is highly offensive or attacking the persona of the faculty. Okay, so I'm sure big changes. We all have the fear when something is new, is it going to work? Um, can we have some data? Can we have some evidence? While we are collecting our uh, school, uh, our university uh, data, um, we went to the different institutions. And what we found, for example, was that the University of Oregon shared actually on their um, assessment website that when they shift from five categories to three categories, I'm basically asking to the students, was this helpful or not? Was the technique helpful or not? They, they shared that first, the reduction of personal comments was reduced from 21% to 1.5%. Um, and then most of those student uh, survey data um, were positive. So over 61% shows like, okay, at least something was helpful and some, something uh, uh, helped them to learn. So hopefully uh, we are aiming that uh, with our new instrument where we can, we can come up with, um, if not the same, maybe better <laughs> um, feedback of the students and matters of participation as well as having a positive environment between the student and the faculty. So how will faculty see this in blue? So it will be, 
the same uh, portal that we have for the current ESEI, but it will be different. So if you notice on your left side, on the slide, you are going to be seeing a question that uh, the faculty right now, that one cannot change, right? That is a mandatory question. Um, so we have to, the manner in which uh, concepts uh, present is, how was that? Now on this one on the right side is going to be an elective. I mean, you notice uh, I can opt to include it or not include it. So you have the menu. So at the beginning of the semester, each faculty for a course can go and set up that instrument for their that fit better their the teaching practices. Again, that is only one example of the questions. Now, I know that the big challenge we have now is that we are shifting from one to five, right? And everybody is wondering, what is my average, right? I am between three and four, I am between four and five. And that needs also a change on the a mindset. And that is what will be the focus on the next um, a faculty senate uh, micro session on uh, the TACRO survey is actually how do we interpret that data? How do we help faculty as well as PNT committees, department chairs, and evaluation? So, if you notice in, in this example, and I want to thank uh, Diane because she developed uh, this scenario, um, basically, a faculty is getting at the end of the semester this feedback. So, 40% of the class uh, say that this. Um, the way that, that the faculty was uh, conveying these concepts were beneficial versus 30% was neutral and 30% not helpful. What do we do with that data, right? Again, we are not looking for faculty to get uh, a one or a two or three, right? We are getting rid completely of that. This is just kind of a reflection where faculty can use that uh, in their teaching narrative at the end of the semester to really see the data and analyze what is behind that, right? So, okay, I can see that more uh, more students are in the benefit side than the not helpful. Uh, will that kind of foster more um, trying to modify things? Uh, how can I do for helping those that are voting for not helpful? So here kind of is uh, an example. I'm not going to read line by line. You have the slides available, kind of a reflection of what the faculty could be using again for the PNT. Uh, another example in here, in this case, we have maybe a classroom that is a very large setting, right? Maybe we are having um, um, more than 75 students in the classroom, and now we are getting a different type of percentage. Or if we have a small uh, class setting, right, and you have maybe less than 40 students, how is that going to be impacting your, your uh, feedback for the students? So again, the idea is to use that data as one piece of the information and then give the chance to the faculty to provide a narrative to explain and reflect on the data that they get from the students. I wanted to end the presentation acknowledging to show you that this has been a four year uh, effort. We started in 2020 when we uh, started with the early feedback and then how this project keeps moving forward and trying to, to get more data as well as to thank the ITS team because they have been very helpful on implementing this information. Uh, so if anybody has questions, um, I'm happy to address any of those. Like a couple people are on their way to the mics. Hey, Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay Reinhardt, Everly College School of Social Work. I think this looks great. Um, one question I have is you have the different kind of sub specialty questions um, is if you have considered online, like I know you have technology questions, but there are different things, kind of nuances. Are you building community? Is it interactive enough that it might be helpful to have some specific questions for engaging online teaching? Oh, thank you for your question and your feedback. So um, that's why we wanted to have these sessions to kind of gather more feedback and, and see how we can help faculty from different teaching modalities. So. Um, if you don't mind, maybe we can reach out after the meeting and I can learn more, more from you or which type of questions would you consider that could be uh, more uh, suitable for the online teaching. Perfect. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, Ruchi Bhandari from School of Public Health. Thank you so much for this great change. But a few things. Uh, in the percentages that you had, it did not show the responses. Uh, 
um, like 40, 40, 20 that you had, mm -hmm. that's only out of the people who responded. Yes, what if, yes. right? So how are you factoring in the students who have not responded, the percentage? And that, that is a great question. And we have a discussion as well of when do you consider that the survey is representative of your class, right? Because if you have 45 students and only five students participate, that is not representing the whole, whole uh, cohort. So um, I think that is a challenge that we are facing with the student participation. When you are seeing in Blue Era the, num you know, the percentages, it will show how many students out of 40, these many students participated. So you will have the counts. Uh, you will have the total count number as well as the percentage. Um, so I, I don't know if that will be some discussion maybe at the department level, at the school levels, or maybe uh, maybe it would be the phase two of when do we consider that a survey has enough participation? I know it's been a challenge. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, faculty are trying to do different things to promote participation. But, yeah, I we, we have to keep that on mind. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's okay. But is it okay to ask a few? Sure. Okay, so um, most of your questions, not most, most of them would be fine, but then some of them would require NA, not applicable. And when NA is not there, people are going to, students are going to mark neutral maybe, I don't know, I'm just assuming. So how will we factor in that part? Oh, uh, that is, okay. Um... We tried to come up with those five mandatory questions. We think we thought that do that those ones could be for every institution, right? Now the electives. If you don't want to ask that question, you don't just put it on your. On no, your I system. was talking about the mandatory the one. Mandatory for example, you... a specific question was, you know, I, I don't remember it exactly, but adapting to the learning okay. if it's something. Now several of the students would be just regular students. And so, you know, they would not feel there was any adaptation needed. And in that case, neutral is what they would mark. But actually, it should have been NA because they don't, right? So okay. I think there might be a penalty for the students, uh, or for the faculty in that respect. There are a few more things, but I think I should not. Uh, so maybe, Marina, you and I can... Um, yeah, I would will, I will love to fill up, uh, follow up with you and see what suggestions and maybe I can bring that back to TACO and then we can discuss if okay. some of those questions actually are non-mandatory, they could be uh, maybe elective, so you just choose if you need to. Thank you so much. Hi, it's Scott Critchell, Everly. Um, I, at first, I actually want to thank Ruchi for bringing up the issue about the completion of these, because that's been the biggest problem I think lots of schools and departments have had is that so many students don't do that anymore, period. Um, I have like one precise question and one kind of broader one. Um, so if you wouldn't mind that, if you wouldn't mind taking two, Marina. Uh, the one about um, when you're guiding students saying the first part of the paragraph is it's anonymous, but if you say something you shouldn't say, then it's not. Yeah. Is that going to imply to students that it's not really anonymous and therefore they might be scared of filling it out? I know it is, it's been a challenge um, and I um, I completely see the student perspective of like, oh, I have the big brother, right? Like someone is watching me. Um, so far, uh, even right now, right in the new, uh, in the old ESEI. So we have faculty are anonymous, uh, uh, sorry, the, the survey is anonymous. Faculty doesn't know if someone has uh, provided a negative feedback, uh, or sometimes they will request to tackle, can you redact this comment or can you follow up with this student? That um, um, uh, identity of the student is still confidential for the faculty. It is going to be just the um, student um, academic integrity uh, office. That is the only one that I don't know how, but they are able to find out, I guess, uh, uh, and reach out to that student. And I know that is something that we have to be very careful um, to really um, provide that trust and that environment to the students to say, feel free, you know, you, you can share your concerns. But at the same time, um, how do we do when a student is using this kind of instrument to just vent and, um, uh, you know, attack a faculty? So again, I, I can see how the justice here 
uh, it is going to be two ways. So um, I'm open up for any suggestion if you kind of think of any. No, I, mean, I, I realize <laughs> lots of y'all have worked on this. Um, I, I just, and I greatly appreciate this because it looks like it's taken forever. Um, but also, I mean, I, I would just be paying extra attention to that wording, because especially okay. if we already had the issue about students not com completing in the first place, you don't want to give them like more reasons like not to. Okay, okay. Thank my, you. My one broader question, and it might actually not be for you, um, but it's, it's my understanding that either in state code or tied to HEPC or something like that, that there's a requirement that the university has to complete these as part of its work. Or it's, it's like the requirement to evaluate faculty, that, that some sort of student evaluation is required. Um, if this is being taken more and more out of the, out of the FEC process or more devalued inside of that, um, I think it would be very helpful for either the committee or the provost office or somebody, whoever's like in charge, if that's accurate. It might not be accurate, but I've heard that in the past. Um, I believe it is a, a state requirement, isn't it, that we seek some sort of student feedback? What? I don't know if it's elsewhere, Scott. I know it's uh, an HLC requirement for a broad way of including student voice. It is not well defined what that means, but it's about essentially the experience in the classroom. We also have it in our BOG rules and students' rights and responsibilities. Okay. Um, that more or less fits with what I've generally heard, which is that it's kind of sort of there in a vague cloud. Um, I would say like, but as this moves forward, just for what, whether it's your office, whether it's TACO, that that gets kind of communicated to the faculty at large. Because I think lots of people like know it's kind of sort of a requirement. And like if we're moving forward, just like make everybody understand kind of that we're still in the same zone we're supposed to be in. So, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Hi, <clears throat> this is Billy Vans from the School of Nursing. Um, thank you. So just a couple comments and uh, one question. I think we're actually piloting this at the School of Nursing, but. First, I want to say I applaud your work because I think it's much needed for them to focus on teaching versus the instructor. As we know, anonymity sometimes unfortunately breeds contempt. And the, the questions or the comments that students leave are frequently caustic versus constructive. And what, that's what we really want is to see constructive because we all want to improve what we're doing. Um, one, I think I'm just reiterating what somebody else said about the mandatory question, making sure that it really covers the mod all the different modalities because we sometimes have online asynchronous courses in which there is no class discussion. So for instance, the mandatory question about class discussions were beneficial, similar to the last speaker, I believe. If there's not an NA, then, or if that's a mandatory question that we can't remove, then we could maybe get some feedback that was inappropriate um, or like not really reflective. And then the next one is about when you have multiple faculty teaching on a course, um, I'm concerned that like we team teach frequently with one quarter and the coordinator and then several other faculty lecture in there. And so you want to offer that evaluation to get feedback from those students. <clears throat> One, I believe it only releases to the students that you're listed in your section. But what I'm also concerned about is that you, but you're lecturing to maybe everybody in that course. Um, so maybe your feedback you're not getting, I think this is just some technology things that need to be worked out. Um, it could increase the number of surveys students have to complete if I'm listed in two different sections. And so as another faculty, so they have to do two surveys on two faculty so then they get survey uh, burden and burnout. So just something to think about for the future. So. Thank, thank you for that. That is also one of my concerns because of my school, we also have team teaching and we have different faculty coming at different time of the semester. So when I check with the um, ideas, they assure me that they will have, we will have that, that flexibility of having multiple instructors and then giving that at different times. So not everything comes, comes together. Hi, Suzanne goes in Kitchen Chambers College. I want to reiterate the need for the NA box. I definitely see that there's a need for that to be in the five questions that are mandatory and the others that might be um, added as additional. But the question that I specifically have is the, the um, comment regarding um, coaching students to stick to topics or, or address topics that the instructor only has control over in the comment section isn't probably the only place that's going to affect folks because some of the first five are things we don't have control over. For example, if you teach in a large lecture hall and a student doesn't prefer that modality of learning, the lectures and the midterm exams and whatever, 
Well, you might not have any control over that at all. That was that was designed by the university. It's being redesigned with academic transformation. You may have no control over whether or not that is the way you get to teach it or not. It's given to you or assigned to you, but students may not know that. And if you add this into the mandatory question, it kind of negates the opportunity for students to only focus on you know, evaluating or, or giving feedback on the things that the teacher can control, how we're going to control for that. So um, my understanding is that the way that we try to word those questions, um, it could be, doesn't matter if you are teaching to a small section or a big section. I, I know that um, like when we are talking about adapting to students, the way we saw that question was, assuming that the faculty is going to kind of gain some feedback at the beginning of the semester with the early teaching assessment or early teaching feedback, and then kind of uh, adapt. So I don't know, for example, uh, the students may say, oh, we would like to have more practice questions, or we will have to do more exercises, or can you do more examples, rather than, oh, I want to have this classroom in a smaller section or or, or a big section. I My understanding is that I think the students um, already assume that if they are in a big classroom, there is nothing that the faculty can do over that. Or maybe that a course maybe is being taught by three instructors. And sometimes the students will say, oh, I just want one instructor in my whole course. Well, that is something that faculty cannot control. So we also have the opportunity as a faculty when we are writing the narrative to really explain, these are the things I can control. Some students are still complaining about things that are beyond my control and just write that in the narrative of the faculty. Um, but I appreciate your feedback on the NA and I will bring that back to TACO. So just to clarify my conversation, I was speaking about the very first question that was in your list of mandatory questions, the manner in which concepts were presented was beneficial, neutral, or not helpful. And what I'm saying is that you may not have any control as the teacher over how you get to present material in a large lecture class with say 300 students and a student who answers that question is not yet asking the question answering the question about um, individualized learning or you know changes to individualized instruction they're just saying hey how was this presented well when the teacher has 300 kids in a the classroom they're going to lecture and maybe they're going to do a practice problems and then they're going to get on out of there and students may mark that that was not helpful to them but that literally is a thing that faculty members have not any control over. And, but it's now a mandatory question. So it's like a catch 22. I, I, I see what your point is. Uh, let me bring that question back to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Hi uh, Brian Leary, School of Medicine. I just had a quick question of the uh, elective based question areas at the end. Are those questions coming from your committee and they're pre-scripted or is we as faculty making those questions? Okay, so those elective questions are actually built up into the Coursera and then we uh, the faculty can select them. Uh, your question about can the faculty have the freedom to add a question? Uh, I have, we have received that feedback from another group. So um, um, we are going to, uh, when we get all the feedback, we will get back to everybody. I, I know that here is a challenge here. So I we feel like this, at least these questions, if we are already there, it's like a, a menu and you choose, they have been already validated, right? So we know that they are not going to be that risk of uh, uh, students going off and, and try to provide, uh, you open that door of uh, negative feedback. Sometimes if a faculty writes a question, you are writing with one intention and a framework, but maybe the students interpret on a different way. So I can see how, yes, I want to have a new feedback because maybe I'm using a new technique in the classroom or I have a practicum or a skill that I want to assess. Um, and I really want to know about that. But at the same time, if I word it my way, maybe I can open a Pandora box and now I start getting a lot of negative. Um, uh, feedback from faculty, but yes, we My are open. It was the fact that faculty would be able to write our own questions because if we came from like a quantitative background and no qualitative experience, it's very easy for us to write leading questions mm -hmm. and only ask questions that highlight what we do well. And mm -hmm. if that's the case, then I'm not saying I would do it, but there may be faculty members that don't necessarily want to drive a change that have historically had low SEIs. 
-hmm. And now they can write a question that leads that says they are historically doing better and there's no really impetus to change because what they see as a question was that. Uh, so that was my thing was I, so, I don't think we should have the ability to write those without university training on how to write Likert questions and it approved huh. from our department chairs before those put on. So again, that is being discussed. We still don't, uh, don't, we are not sure about how to deal with that. If we have something that the department has to come up with something or the school have to decide, okay, these are the mandatory questions. For example, in my school, we have mandatory questions and, and that is, you know, in addition, you can ask, but we have mandatory. So again, um, I think um, that is something that we can explore and maybe bring back next, next meeting. Um, because I can see pros and cons for each each as the, the freedom of writing or not adding or having just a prescriptive um, questions. Thank you for your question. Tom? Oh. I think there is one in- Hi, uh, Marina. <clears throat> Hi, Marina. Tom, Tom Zenni, we'll Chambers College. Um, the, the point of validation in the question items is a good one. I want to come back to uh, mainly the, the five mandatory questions, um, because I think those are the ones that stick out to me. Uh, is there a validation plan as you're collecting the pilot data for those questions going forward? I'm assuming you work with some kind of structure, putting it together. Uh, initially, I was thinking the spot assessment is uh, were standardized questions. You mentioned uh, validated questions. Uh, did they come from somewhere? Uh, are these questions that we that your group wrote? So we have been looking at other peer institutions as well as we have uh, identifying different literature what they were using. Now we we word them because some of the schools have uh, used wording that students won't be able to um, recognize. So how can you you know give your opinion if you cannot? recognize what is being asked. Um, so, so that is why we have been already offering this pilot for certain schools that either the dean or the department chair agree for. Um, and we are having already one year and a half of data. So I think we have been collecting information and then um, we will move forward with that. When we are asking faculty for the feedback on that new instrument. Um, and again, my question for the validation will be more about if someone all of a sudden start deciding to write a question, actually, are you asking um, the right question or the right way? Um, but yeah, it, that is a great question. I think that will be a phase two after we um, we uh, we make the shift to this uh, new instrument. And you're, if, Marina, it's Frankie, you're, you're gonna report on the pilot mm -hmm. data next month, yes? Yes, we are uh, collect, trying to collect, and this uh, again a call for those faculty who have been um, involved. Um, if your school has been involved on the SPT or the spot, uh, we have reached out to you. So uh, if you have any feedback, positive or negative, we take it. Uh, please um, um, check your emails. We we have been bombarding you with emails. <laughs> And so is, is that whole process uh, of validation going to be documented and available to us, Marina? Um, yes, so that is what we are doing. We are asking faculty, how do you feel about this, the new, the, this new instrument? A year ago, we already have a survey sent to those faculty that participated. And now we are doing more like a one-on-one -on -one or reaching a focus group to kind of gain more feedback. Um, uh, and again, one of the biggest challenges we are having it is the student participation. So again, it's like how I rely on, uh, you know, when the survey is only five students out of the whole class participating. Uh, but that data, I'm, I, my goal is to show that in the next, uh, in the next meeting. Okay, very good. Because uh, I think uh, in particular, my, my concern is uh, with some of the items uh, from an item and test development standpoint, um, not understanding what we're trying to measure uh, mm -hmm. and being able to understand that the items that we're assessing uh, particularly the, the core items that are going to be mandatory, uh, that we have some validation that they're actually measuring what we want and intend them to. Um, for example, that second question about discussions, I'm assuming that's mm -hmm. uh, more broadly representative of classroom interaction. Yes. Um, we might mm -hmm. only capture discussion in that. And, uh, if we have a, uh, you know, administrative type decisions being made off of these evaluations, I think that data is important. And, and this will be a learning point, right? So 
once we collect and get their feedback, we can realize that, oh, it should not say class, you know, it should not be discussion, it should be class interaction or, you know, other, other wording that will be constructed. But again, we create the questions because the questions that we saw on other, on other institutions were way more complex. They were using pedagogical terminology. I was like, the students won't know about this. <laughs> There's definitely something to be said for the, the simplicity approach. So thank you, Marina, to you and the committee as well. Thank you so much. Um, online, Amy Weislogel. Hi, uh, Amy Weislogel, Eberly College. Thank you, Marina. I really appreciated learning more about uh, the work you guys have been doing and uh, appreciate your efforts. I recently, as in like this morning, <laughs> learned about a... Um, an approach that might help with the student response rate. So it's a little bit off topic in terms of the content of the uh, evaluation, but the mechanism or the, the, how, how it's laid, uh, how it's basically presented to the students. And the idea is that you basically subsample your class throughout the semester and each student gets basically sampled twice, but then the faculty member or instructor gets weekly feedback that's digested. So you, instead of this like, you know, middle and end kind of scenario, the students feel like they're getting a chance to engage throughout the semester. And they call, you know, there's a whole article and I can uh, share that with you. I already typed an email and I was just going to send it to you, but it's enough of a departure from how we've traditionally done things that I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, I think it, like I said, I think it has the opportunity to give the students more motivation to give feedback on the class that they're in that could then be changed to, to, you know, based on their feedback and not just at the end when it's more you know, the Yelp scenario when they're kind of complaining after the fact or or complimenting after the fact at times. Um, and so I just wanted to bring that up and I'm, uh, I'll share the article with you that you guys could consider because I think it has some advantages that might uh, address some of the problems that have been brought up today. Thank you, Amy. Um, and I love that you bring that up because I think that is kind of closing the loop of how faculty can be fostering a continuous improvement. And actually we already have tools and I am I'm going to send an email to all faculty reminding about the um, early uh, feedback evaluation that is optional. Again, that is not mandatory, but you can get feedback and kind of convey to the students about the changes, the, the feedback that you give me is going to impact you and not the next cohort. And even with iClicker, right? Uh, now that we have the institution has iClicker, you have that option at the end of each class to kind of ask a quick survey to the students for those of you who are using it. So I, I guess that is great because it's fostering now the, the, the mind shift of, okay, I don't need to report one piece of data for my PNT. I'm going to show that actually I care for the learning of the students and I listen and I, and I adapt. And also the students are also going to be providing better feedback because they realize that you are listening to them. Thank yeah, you. it would be great if it was kind of a, a support that was offered from the university instead of each faculty member kind of doing that continuously, because the ability to digest that information and display it in a graphical form is one of the powers of the SEI, right, that it comes back and it's very, it communicates the information um, in a very easily reportable manner. So that kind of tool, I think, would be helpful for faculty and instructors. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Appreciate you taking that feedback and taking it back to your committee. Our uh, next report is to be from Leslie Cottrell, but I understand she also does not have a report today. So next we'll hear from Scott Wayne, Chair of Shared Governance Committee. Scott Wayne, Statler College of Engineering and Mineral Resources, Chair of Shared Governance Committee. So we have uh, three primary activities going on in shared governance this year. I've heard about two of them. Uh, the first being um, um, coordinating faculty engagement in the presidential search. Um, that group is being chaired by Stan Heilman, uh, who's also currently a member of the Board of Governors. So there's a good connection there with getting our input into the board. Um, that group is going to look first at uh, characteristics, qualifications, faculty would like to see in presidential candidates. Uh, and we will compile a list out of uh, Stan's group, uh, vet that list through uh, the rest of the Shared Governance Committee, and present a list of uh, qualifications to the Senate for input and for uh, approval. Um, second activity around 
presidential search, uh, a list of questions that we would like to have presented to the top candidates uh, that would be, be answered by those candidates, uh, potentially de-identified, um, because we're not certain how the search and interview process is going to play out at this point uh, until the Board of Governors sort of finalizes that process. Uh, but we would be able to get feedback from the candidates on questions that uh, the faculty would like to put forward. Um, the, um, our, the search committee would obviously uh, be able to identify those candidates, and our representatives on the search committee would then be able to incorporate faculty feedback uh, based on the answers that the candidates uh, give to those questions. A third activity will be uh, developing procedures for selecting faculty representatives uh, to serve on the search committee. Um, and uh, that activity is um, waiting a little bit until we have a little bit better sense of the number of representatives that uh, faculty will have on the committee and the structure of the search committee itself. Um, second um, activity that we have going on um, is around the uh, revision of um, faculty constitution. Uh, that originally that group was going to look at some amendments to the existing constitution. Uh, now that uh, Frankie and the Senate leadership um, have prioritized doing a major rewrite of the constitution, that group um, will, um, in the shared governance committee, will evaluate the changes that are proposed by um, the executive committee group. Um, and um, provide input um, and then uh, vet that back again uh, to faculty senate uh, for final approval. Third activity is looking at um, college governance uh, or shared governance at the college level. Uh, we're just getting started with that activity. Emily Murphy is chairing that group. Um, and the idea is to look at improving uh, shared governance at the college level. Um, we typically talked a lot about shared governance at the university level, but we believe there's also opportunity uh, to improve governance at the college level. Uh, not sure exactly what that those recommendations and that activity is going to look like. We're just getting started with that work. Um, so that is my report, Frankie. Happy to take any questions. Questions for Scott? <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. Next, we have a report from Eloise Elliott, our representative to state government. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to have a report until, uh, since Travis Mullahan is on the agenda today, he will be um, giving us an update on the current legislative activities going on. And um, so after his report later in the meeting, I'll be available to answer questions with Travis as well, if there's anything I can provide. Um, one thing that uh, Frankie did ask me to mention, for those of you that were interested in Senate Bill 269 um, about the drug testing strips that did pass, um, the, legis the legislation passed on Friday, and so those are no longer listed as drug paraphernalia. So for those of you interested in that field. Um, in terms of DEI, I think um, Travis will mention that. Thank you, Eloise. We're gonna table questions to Eloise until after Travis's presentation too. Thank you. Okay, um, next is our representative to the Board of Governors, but Stan uh, also has said he does not have a report because the BOG hasn't met yet since our last meeting. Um, BOG meets on the 20th, second and 23rd, so I'm sure Stan will have things to tell us next time. And next we have our esteemed President E. Gordon. Thank you, Frankie. Sir, first of all, Dr. Peralta, I have no idea where she disappeared to, but she, what a wonderful presentation. They have worked very hard and I really appreciate the fact that we are on the cutting edge of doing something I think fundamentally sound and I really appreciate that. Um, so El Eloise and I were together at uh, the West Virginia Day at the legislature, and it was a great success last Tuesday, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And as she said, Travis will be on um, 
we'll be on in a minute to, to talk about the legislative uh, activities. But I'll just say that um, our we had a robust uh, presentation um, in the state capitol. For those of you who've been there, that there's a uh, there's uh, uh, two long hallways, and uh, we had uh, faculty, staff, students, a number of people there talking about what we're doing. The legislature showed a great deal of interest in what we we're doing, um, and uh, certainly uh, we we focused on workforce development, economic prosperity, health care, youth programming, families, youth, and other visitors were exploring and being interactive. Obviously, we have a wonderful program um, statewide in 4-H, and uh, our 4-H students were there in mass. Um, uh, in addition, uh, we had our two budget hearings um, before the House and the Senate. This is actually the first time since I've been here that we've had a budget hearing before the House Finance Committee, um, and they were held back to back, and we did them um, we did them in in uh, in connection with uh, Marshall's hearing also. Um, and um, it was a, it was a, a, a very, very productive uh, set of conversations. I will say that uh, Paula Congilio, who's our vice president for finance and our CFO, did a terrific job. Um, so I really appreciate her. And I want to thank Pratt Travis. Uh, he'll be on in a minute, but um, Travis does a great job, um, and he's highly respected in the, in the halls of the legislature. Um, and he's doing a great job in being very uh, proactive in informing us about the issues that we ought to be confronting uh, so that many of those get headed off before we have to deal with them. Now, I hope you saw in E! News today we are working to implement policies required by the 2023 campus carry legislation with guidelines to ensure the safety of our faculty, our staff, and students. And I would hope that everyone in this room will continue to follow those uh, the, those e-news e implementation and details. Um, and Travis, by the way, chairs that committee, so you could also ask him about that. Um, um, but I will say that um, uh, our our days at the legislature, I've spent the full, almost the full week this past week there, that uh, we have uh, tremendous uh, recognition and support for many of the things we're doing. Um, our, pioneering, our pioneering spirit has also earned national recognition, again, as the university has been tapped to help accelerate commercialization of medical breakthroughs by collaborating with the nationwide network within the National Institutes of Health. Uh, West Virginia University is just one of 127 entities consisting of higher education institutions and private industry to be named a partner for the Investor Catalyst Hub, a regional hub of the Advanced Research Projects Agency. For health. We are the only member, by the way, from West Virginia. And as a member of the hub, we will have access to potential funding and flexible contracting for faster award execution compared to traditional government contracts. Now, I found this one interesting. I just always like to have something that is sort of fun, but we have, uh, our university has been, uh, has also generated some good buzz as a certified affiliate of the B Campus USA program. Um, that uh, with that uh, with an understanding of the benefits bees and other insects have for the environment, the Office of Sustainability has worked to support pollinators on campus by increasing native plants and providing nest sites. The benefits of that work are reflected in this national designation. And after the successful implementation of a pollinator garden, the Sustainable Landscapes Committee formed in early 2023 to further these efforts. The committee is currently developing uh, a cattail garden below Evansdale Crossing to serve as a pollinator area. And student volunteers, by the way, are uh, uh, have joined this group to plant more than 100 pollinator um, uh, pollinator uh, and water loving and and water uh, spaces. I will say. Now I, I want to end. Uh, we had this, uh, not this Sunday, but the Sunday ago, we had um, a large group of high ability prospective students on campus. Um, uh, I had their parents and the students over to Blaney House. And uh, the event, of course, provides us an opportunity to identify some of the best and brightest students. Um, 
who have applied to the institution, but also in this state and beyond. Um, and it gives them a chance to kick our tires. Um, and I can say that our recruitment continues to go really quite well. One of the problems that we do face, um, which of course is of concern to me and should be to all of us, and that is the fact that the federal government has not been able to really get its act together to uh, get our FAFSA issues resolved. And uh, I lay that directly at the, uh, at the feet of the Department of Education. They've just been incapable in, in getting their work done. And so I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, but it will affect um, parental decisions student decisions about where they're going to go and what selections they're going to be, they're going to make. So it's going to delay a number of our own planning as we don't know what is going to happen with, uh, with enrollment until many of those issues are resolved. So saying that, I'm, I'm open to any questions that anyone may have. Thing of hearing none, Madam Chair, it's your turn. Thank you, President Gee. I want to say I'm I'm thrilled that we have one of those distinguished scholars coming into our mental health and addiction studies program in the fall. And she and her mother were, when I asked them if they were being treated well, first of all, they said they'd been fed very well. That was the main thing. They spent about 10 minutes telling me all the meals they had had, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that um, that they had had dinner at Blaney House. They were very impressed with your engagement, and I think it was one of the things that was making a difference for them. So we appreciate that. She also was impressed. They were also impressed that there's a bee club. So the bees are doing lots of good work for us in addition to pollinating. Okay, now we're here from uh, Provost Reed, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in my short report today, I want to start by providing a brief update on the college mergers. It was about three weeks ago that we announced the name and the leadership of the new academic unit coming out of the merger between the College of Creative Arts and the Reed College of Media and several design programs coming from the Davis College. Beginning July 1st, the new unit will be called the College of Creative Arts and Media uh, with current creative arts dean, Keith Jackson, serving as the dean of the new unit for two years which was his preferred timeline to serve. The College of Media will become the School of Media and Communications and current, although some programs are moving into other schools, um, and current media dean Diana Martinelli will serve as school director as well as vice dean of the new college for one year to help with the transition. The realignment of the Davis College with WVU Extension will be housed in a new unit called the Division for Land Grant Engagement. Davis will remain a college, but its name will be changed to the Davis College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, um, removing design from the name. WVU Extension Dean Jorge Atiles, a proven and dynamic leader, will serve as Associate Vice President for Land Grant Engagement and Dean of the WVU Extension and the Davis College. There are different reasons for our different approaches to both of these uh, units, and my team and I will be happy to answer questions, any questions that you might have um, after my report, or feel free to send an email um, with your questions or concerns directly to me or to Paul Kreider, um, who is overseeing the mergers. Unrelated to the mergers, there will be a change of leadership at WVU Potomac State. As you may have heard, um, just about a week ago, President Gilmer announced that he will be stepping down as president on March 15th. This was entirely his decision, and it is our understanding that he is returning to Mississippi, where he is from, and he'll be pursuing other opportunities there. Chris is a wonderful person. He loves WVU. He loves Potomac State, and we wish him well. Um, we are working very quickly to identify an interim president to ensure that there's a smooth transition, and we will be making an announcement very soon regarding that. Faculty and leadership at both regional campuses um, have asked for a delay in the program portfolio review process to give them more time to prepare their self-studies. We have agreed to do that, which means their self-studies will be due on March 22nd. 
We will make our preliminary recommendations on April 12th and our final recommendations to the Board of Governors at their June board meeting. The delay will not impact the timeline as we have already said publicly that if there is a RIF process, it will not take place until the fall. Um, finally, today you will be hearing a report from Fred King, our Vice President for Research. He's going to be talking about the continued increase in research productivity at WVU, as well as improvements that uh, we are making and he is making in his office to OSP um, that are very positive. I also want to share that the WVU Foundation recently made a contribution to support undergraduate research, recognizing it as a high impact experience for students and a benefit for faculty who um, enjoy working with undergraduate students on research. The $400,000 contribution will provide funding for the Summer Undergraduate Research Experience, or SURE program, over the next three years. And this will allow more students to participate, uh, and it will increase the student stipend from $4,500 to $5,000, which is, is a good thing because many of these students are under-resourced, and this allows them to concentrate full-time on their research. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that um, Supporting faculty research continues to be a priority, and we do hope to be able to provide some relief to faculty um, in FY2025 who have not been able to access um, their overhead accounts. We know this is a concern, and it is a priority for the administration, um, and we are hoping that we will have the funding to do that. So I wanted to end on that note. I'm happy to take any questions. Hey there. I don't, I don't know whether to address this to you or not, but <clears throat> we were talking this morning. I think there's still a lot of confusion out there about being able to spend startup packages or indirects and that kind of thing. And I didn't know if there was some clarity uh, to get on that or not, because I think there's still com some confusion because of the uh, inconsistencies between colleges. And things. Right. So the, when I meant overhead, I meant the indirects. Um, and so we know that um, if it wasn't budgeted, <laughs> for this year that we actually can't spend it for this year. So we really have to work at for FY 2025. Um, startup funding, my understanding is that um, we as a provost office were able to commit to our usual portion of startups um, and that mo the colleges mostly were able to meet this year's um, startup requests, but not all of them. So it's really on a college to college basis. Am I missing anything team? That's about right, yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? Oh, okay. Louise Elliott, hey, College Louise. of Applied Human Sciences. Um, so when you talk about the indirect funds, <clears throat> the, um, the indirect funds that come in to, um, from grants, like to centers, and we use those funds to run the centers, but now, we are unable to use those indirect funds. Are you talking about the ones, if they're not frozen, then they're not frozen, but some of these accounts are frozen. Are they frozen by the university? They are part of our budget. Um, and if you haven't been told they're frozen, then they're not frozen. No, we're told that the university has frozen all indirects. Because that's part of our budget. Um, it's not a separate item. We that revenue comes in and it's been contributing to our overall budget. This is for this academic year. So those indirects will, will no longer be available. No, 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 just not right now. Okay. Our goal is to free up as much of them as we can for next year. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Hi, Travis Douglas from the School of Public Health. I had a question about incentive funds for faculty that have been reduced in force. I was wondering what was going to happen to the funds for those individuals that have been frozen. Um, so I think I heard you. Um, you asked about funds for um, faculty who were part of the reduction in force. Um, are you referring to research funds or are you referring? No, I'm referring to research incentive funds. Funds that were returned to the faculty for use as, you know, bridge funding or for other things that have been frozen as part of the 
academic transformation process. I understand. I think, um, and I can't answer this definitively, but I'm happy to come back uh, at, a, at a, the next meeting and share. But I think the answer is that if those funds were to be spent while you were at WVU, that those funds are not available, won't be available to this faculty. Sorry. Well, so I'm sorry, and it was hard for me to hear you. I'm sorry, I'm soft-spoken and I'm half deaf. Um, but um, I think was the question part of that, what is going to happen to those funds? Okay, I will, um, I will get back to you on that. If you email me directly, I'll respond to you. Okay, but I can also bring this to the next meeting. Thanks. And now we've invited Dean Diaz to give us an overview of the library restructuring. You have a PowerPoint. You have a PowerPoint. That one. Thank you, Frankie, and thank you for the invitation to update you all on um, what the library is doing around academic transformation. Um, but before I get to that, I just want to get briefly um, update you on the fact that um, uh, some, some questions that have, have come up in this forum and that I wanted to address. So the library's received a, a roughly $1.2 million budget cut at the beginning of this current fiscal year. And so to meet that um, budget cut, we did have some savings in personnel um, to at the rate of $460,000. That amount of money was saved through um, holding vacancies and through um, just, just not filling positions as people left. So we had no rifts, no layoffs this fiscal year. Um, but we did take the remainder of the uh, savings out of our collections budget, um, and that rate was $740,000. Um, and so to achieve these cuts, um, what we have been looking at are our digital materials, which accounts for over 90% of our bu budget. Um, and these include all types of materials represented on this slide. Um, please note that some of the research databases we subscribe to are aggregators. And this means that we pay for not only the finding database, but also the full text of the content that the databases point to. And so um, in some cases, the aggregators duplicate some of the years of what we buy as journal titles or packages. Um, as up to... Uh, December of 2023, we had canceled 41 research databases, 351 journal titles. Um, some of them were part of bundles and some of them were individual subscriptions, 13 eBooks, um, some of which were in packages and some of which were individual titles. And note that some of the canceled journal titles might still be present and available through an aggregator. Um, and we are very close to completing the review of all of these materials. And I would also like to reiterate um, that as always, our interlibrary loan services remain available to um, acquire any materials that we don't have um, available through subscription. So we have online a place for people to request reinstatement of cuts that have been made, uh, but please note that we have very limited funds with which to work. So it's like, unlikely that every request could be accommodated. And then I would also just like to point um, that we also have um, at the same site where, where you can request those reinstatements, we have available a list of all the titles that have been impacted. Um, so all of that information is available at this URL, library.wvu.edu slash collections slash FAQ. 
So now let me turn my attention to um, academic transformation and the coming fiscal year that we are working towards. So um, you may recall that what was um, part, called for and part of our academic transformation was that we were asked to reduce our personnel budget by $800,000 through restructuring. We were asked to make no further changes to our collections budget, and we were asked to review our spaces. And I also want to highlight that this recommendation was made to the university library system and does not affect the divisional campus libraries or the law library, which are under a different administration. Our timeline um, was different than the colleges, as were the other academic support unit reviews. We got our review in September of last year, and um, we were given until December to submit a plan for how we would uh, achieve the goals that was submitted and approved by the provost's office. And um, also in December, then we took um, the personnel actions that we needed to take to um, make our, our goals in this. Um, just last month, we rolled out a restructuring plan to all of our staff in the libraries for how we were going to be doing this work. Um, and so we have kind of started a whole process for internally for doing this work um, such that by July 1st um, of, of this year, um, the new structure will begin. That will be at the start of the new fiscal year. Um, and I would also like to note then that what we have then seen because of this is the net loss of 11 actual positions, um, but 12 state funded positions because we are fortunately uh, able right now to move one of our positions to um, an endowment. And that this represents um, overall a little bit over 10% reduction in staffing overall. So um, the spaces issue that came up in the review, um, the result of that is that no libraries will close. The downtown Evansdale and Health Sciences libraries will all continue to function as they are now, and no changes will be apparent to those who use those facilities. Our book depository also will remain functional and plays a really important role in our ability to store and deliver resources. We have begun conversations regarding potential new tenants in some of our spaces, but no decisions have been made at this time. And then one other thing I just wanna call your attention to before talking about the restructuring is that um, along with the rest of campus, we will be adopting a new budget model um, next year as well. And um, in, the, uh, in the current budget model, we are funded through central funds and through student fee money. Um, and in the new budget model, we will actually be supported by the colleges as will all of the other support units. So there are three principles that are guiding us through this restructuring um, to ensure that we, remain, uh, that we remain and continue to improve upon being the kind of organization this campus needs. We're growing more integrated, ensuring we continue to be impactful by adjusting to campus needs and functioning in a sustainable way. It's important to me both that we sustain the services that campus needs and that our staff have jobs that they like and that are manageable so they can continue to have a positive impact on campus. These three legs of the stool will guide us as we grow into our new structure with the resources we must work with. Libraries are constantly evolving and we are no different. Over the years, the libraries evolved and um, has centralized several back of the house operations that have been invisible to campus. In this restructuring, we are now moving to some of our more user-centered services. Currently, we have an access services unit and a research services unit in each of our three Morgantown libraries. Each have different leaders who work within frameworks. In our new model, these units are being centralized administratively while continuing to do the work they do now. Access services are the folks who check out materials and provide assistance at our desks. They manage the digital and print course reserves. They do all the interlibrary loan work that is highly used and valued on this campus. Our book depository is a critical piece of the circulation and interlibrary loan work. 
None of these activities will change for you or for your students. You should feel no impact from this change. Only our staff will. Our research services units are also being centralized and then split into two new units with new names that we hope will help campus better know how to engage with our librarians. The first will be called research support and engagement. This unit will focus on researcher support, scholarly communications, including open publishing, data services, and our institutional repository, which is a tool that research can, researchers can use to make their scholarship open. The second unit <clears throat> will be called Student Success and Engagement and will focus on our course integrated information literacy instruction, our ULIB credit bearing courses, and our co-curricular outreach and programming. We're not cutting any of our partnerships, collaborations, or services. What will evolve over time is how campus and faculty approach our librarians for these services, and perhaps who they work with on them. We think in some cases it will make it easier for our faculty to know who to work with, but we also recognize that in some cases there are very strong relationships with a particular librarian, and that might evolve over time. Some of the work that is happening this spring um, is to build an articulation of how this structure will work for faculty come next fall. So remember, we are not actually changing this till next, till, uh, next year. So everything works the way that, that it has been right now. Our restructuring work includes both communication and assessment planning. Any changes that faculty need to know about in fall will be communicated at the beginning of the fall semester. Additionally, we have built both uh, internal assessments to ensure that our staff understand what changes are being made and why, and external stakeholder feedback so that we can make sure that campus needs are being met. Our stakeholder feedback will take place towards the end of fall semester, so we will know of any pain points that may arise from our new structure. And finally, I have been asked by some faculty where these reductions have um, that we've experienced leave us in terms of how we compare to our peers. So I'd like to give you a few benchmarking numbers. Um, first is to look at how we spend our money. So libraries, uh, library budgets are tracked in three buckets. Collections, which is the content that we provide. Um, next is personnel and then Finally, operations, which is everything from the pens we buy to the computers for our staff and for students, and servers that houses, house some of our digital content. So you can see in this slide um, that on average, our big 12 peers spend 46.1% of their budget on collections, 45.5% on personnel, and 8.5% on operations. Here at WVU, we spend 51% of our budget on collections, just over 40% on personnel, and just over 8% on operations. This is based on uh, 2021 iPads data, and so there may be changes, but I do know, know that for us, where we will end up in fiscal year 25 will look pretty much like what you see where we are um, in this particular slide. And then um, finally, uh, one other benchmarking note that I will give is just how much money libraries have to spend. Um, and so again, from the 2021 iPads data, the median um, for our peers is $20.1 million, whereas our expenditures were 14.5 million. And of course, ours will be lower in 2025, but I don't have yet data on where our peers will be at that point in time. That's all I have, and if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to take them. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dean, we appreciate that update and all the hard work you all have done. Next, we will um, hear a report from Travis Mullahan online for a legislative update 
and an update on campus carry implementation. <clears throat> good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, thanks, Frankie. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, allowing me to uh, participate virtually. Um, I'll start off with uh, an overview of our budget presentation um, that President Gee and Paula Congilio um, made last week to the House and Senate Finance Committees. I'll talk a little bit about the legislative tracking of issues. Um, I'll give an update on campus carry, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions. So as President Gee mentioned last week, uh, our team was in Charleston for WVU Day on Tuesday, and we presented to the House Finance Committee on Wednesday and the Senate Finance Committee on Thursday uh, as part of their agency budget hearings. This is the first time, as President Gee noted, that we've presented to the House Finance Committee. This is about the fourth or fifth year in a row that we've presented to the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, so in those presentations, they ask a number of questions um, of our operating budgets, our expenses, our revenue, et cetera. But then at the end, they ask specifically for any legislation um, or funding requests that we are making of the legislature. Um, we gave an update on last year's $50 million appropriation for the Cancer Institute and we also gave an update on the nearly 47 million that the university received for deferred maintenance projects that came in for Morgantown, Kaiser, and Beckley campuses. That money came in. Uh, it was appropriated last in the last budget bill, um, but it came in in December um, for our deferred maintenance projects. Uh, so we noted a couple things in our uh, budget presentation. First of all, in the governor's introduced budget. He has proposed another average 5% pay raise for state employees. Um, that includes about $3.5 million to the university. Uh, as I always note, as our team always notes, because the university only receives a small portion of its budget, total budget from the state, that's about 15% of our total budget comes from the state. We only receive a, a proportional amount uh, for those average pay raises. And the state average pay raises is between forty dollars and $50,000. Uh, so we only receive a minimal amount of money for pay raises. Um, if we were uh, to uh, be required to give uh, across the board pay raises of the average 5%, we would need an additional 16 to $17 million. So you can see the, the disparity there between what's provided because uh, we're a highly special revenue agency versus uh, what we receive from our state appropriations. Um, the university is also asking for the legislature to consider uh, some funding um, for uh, higher education, in particular for WVU, in three areas. So first of all, uh, we have had increased costs um, due to the reforms to the Public Employee Insurance Agency. Uh, so last year we had about um, almost an $11 million increase, this year about $5 million. And then we've had increases because of BRIM, uh, that's the Board of Risk uh, and Insurance Management, uh, which assesses all the values of, of all the state buildings and properties. Um, and of course, because of inflation. So we've asked the uh, legislature to consider some funding for those increased costs. Additionally, with our uh, partnership with Marshall, we've put forward uh, a $5 million one-time ask for the first ascent program. Um, that would be a spinoff of the ascend program uh, to keep uh, WVU and Marshall uh, college graduates in West Virginia, helping them uh, find remote works, uh, remote uh, jobs, excuse me, um, and take advantage of the outdoor recreation um, opportunities of the Ascend program. Additionally, the governor has put $5 million for the military Ascend program to attract um, veterans and military service personnel um, to West Virginia as part of the Ascend program. Um, finally, we put forward two opportunities uh, for one-time investments if 
the legislature would decide to spend some of its surplus funding um, on other projects. So first we would ask for the legislature to fund um, some programs at RNI, um, specifically um, a neuromodulation center there. Um, and on Friday, uh, the House of Delegates unanimously passed a, a $2 million supplemental to RNI uh, for a pilot project it has with FDA on PTSD and obesity. And then finally, we've asked the legislature to consider surplus funding for $10 million for our new robotics engineering program. Uh, so as for bills that we're tracking, you know, if you look at the legislative website right now, there's, there's almost 2,200 bills introduced. Um, we're tracking several of them. You know, as I always like to note, it, uh, many of these bills will never see the light of day. They'll never go beyond introduction. They'll ne ne never make it past one committee. Um, or if they do pass one committee or one chamber, they'll not make it anywhere uh, in the other chamber. So, you know, always keep those in mind. There's a number of carryover bills that the legislature has introduced, but a few that I'd like to highlight for you that we are tracking in addition to the R&I money, which uh, the $2 million appropriation, which passed the House and now goes to the Senate. So there's a few more bills that I wanted to highlight for you. So first of all, there's Senate Bill 152 that would require all K through 12 schools and college campuses to display the official motto of the United States, which of course was, was uh, authorized in the 1950s as In God We Trust. Um, right now that bill requires us to display it in all classrooms. Um, that bill did not make it past um, one chamber. Um, it only made it past one chamber last year, but we're tracking that um, so we can share with the legislature the potential cost uh, for displaying that in, in all classrooms. Additionally, we had some representatives from student government at the Capitol today. They're working on Senate Bill 292, which is the Hunger Free Campus Act. Uh, that would enhance uh, food pantries on our campus, uh, food pantries on other campuses that currently have a student food pantry. And then it would help, um, it would help build out food pantries on the college campuses that don't, ha uh, that don't have them. So the SGA president and vice president were at the Capitol today meeting with legislators. We also have Senate Bill 589. Uh, that would permit our campus police officers uh, to um, go into one of the state pension plans. Um, they're, they're the only law enforcement agency in the state that doesn't have a defined pension plan. Uh, so we're working with our local delegates and senators on that bill. Uh, there's Senate Bill 591, which would allow all spending units to contract directly with WVU and Marshall for services. We currently have um, that authority with the three uh, DHHR agencies, so the three new agencies that were once DHHR. We think that that will create um, some efficiencies for state agencies to work directly with us and hopefully um, generate some revenue for the university from those state agencies. House Bill 5038, 5038 uh, would um, add economic development to the list of priorities for our um, higher education research corporations. And then House Bill 5217 would include Potomac State um, as a permanent addition to the learn and earn, learn and earn program, which is a, um, a classification for the CTCs, uh, the community and technical colleges. And there's also a number of bills on childhood in, immunizations. Um, we've been a pretty strong advocate against any changes to childhood immunizations for a number of years. Uh, none of those bills have made it to a committee agenda but we're tracking some that might provide for a religious exemption or other type of exemption. And we wanna make sure that those childhood immunization laws um, stay on the books and we continue to protect our, um, our young um, West Virginians and our older West Virginians from measles, et cetera. Uh, Eloise mentioned DEI. Um, that is, of course is an issue that we're tracking. Um, we've only seen one bill introduced and that was early in session and that was a carryover bill that didn't go anywhere last year. Uh, so right now there's been no further movement um, related to DEI. 
Uh, we, we have collected some information related to our accreditation standards, our professional, professional licensure requirements, um, the funding of DEI positions and um, operations at the university, as well as some of the programming, just to be prepared. We don't know yet what um, a DEI bill might say, so it's a little premature to um, speculate, but we want to be prepared once a bill uh, language uh, once a bill drops or we get to see language um, in, in advance. And then lastly, I'll close out with uh, campus carry. Our subgroup uh, continues to meet. Um, we have made a few recommendations up to the steering um, committee, those being that we uh, have the Board of Governors uh, adopt a rule for implementing campus carry, and that we also work um, to procure um, um, some um, advanced security measures like metal detectors, uh, et cetera. So, um, I expect there to be a draft rule presented to the Board of Governors at their February meeting. That will go out for public comment, so you all will, will get a chance to see that, and make, some, um, make some comments to that, um, or ask any questions about that before uh, the Board would ultimately adopt that. And then finally, our facilities folks uh, are talking to some vendors uh, and getting estimates on what uh, it might cost to install metal detectors, um, build out storage lockers in, in one or two dorms, et cetera. So uh, Frankie, that is that is my report and I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that folks might have. Thank you, Travis. Any questions for Travis? Thank you, I think that's it. Yes, yeah, stay hydrated down there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. We appreciate it, Travis. Thank you. Um, next up is Fred King to give us an update on the good work he's been doing and hearing our concerns about OSP and working to make improvements. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time this afternoon. First, a little bit of good news. As you may know, the research enterprise continues to grow at the university. Externally sponsored work from 2018 to 2023 grew from $155 million to $231 million. And the growth wasn't linear. It accelerated over time. So the last three years have been more like 10%, 11%, 16%. But the first six months, of this year, going from July to December, we hit a target of $134 million. To put that in context, in all of 2015, we did $138 million. The growth was 26% over this time last year. So the research at the university, the extended expen external expenditures continue to grow. Now that's great news, but I want to advance the slide. Why is that? Doesn't seem to want to advance the slide. Oh, there we go. Let's go back. Okay. Gotta go back. Okay, way ahead. All right, sorry about that technical difficulties. So since the pandemic though, there have been changes really in the research administration. So what this means is that we've been losing personnel and it's not unique to the university. This is across all of academia and also within the federal government. An example is that we called a check on an NSF career award. It's been the same with the agency for a while, much longer than it normally would sit when we asked the person at NSF, when will we know about the award? 
They said, we can't tell you because we don't have enough staff to get these processed quick enough. So while we've been losing these awards over time, we've also been losing institutional knowledge. Because the people we would lose, whether they went to another institution, because right now it's kind of musical chairs out there for research administrative professionals. Some of them just retired, but they took with them institutional knowledge. And WVU has always been a place while I've been here that is somewhat relationship driven. The person in one office knew who to call in another office to get work done. As we've lost experienced people, those connections at the university have been lost. And it's hard to rebuild those. We would hire new staff, get them trained, but they couldn't learn that quick enough. And the other thing was, because we had a shortage of personnel, their workloads were extremely high. The standard from um, the association that's out there for research professionals is usually you have a work load of about 50 transactions per person. Ours were more than double that, because again, we were short on staff. The volume, the complexity of the proposals was increased. I mentioned the growth of research expenditures. That just reflects how the awards have been growing as well. And so the result that the faculty felt, you all who are out there who actually do the research and bring in the dollars, was that there were unacceptable lag times between an award being made and the time in which you could access it in the financial system. So that's something that we're trying to remedy. So in terms of the staffing level of OSD, to give you a context for that, if we were fully supported, we would have 38 individuals working. When we first began the problem, this started around 2021, we lost a number of individuals, experienced individuals, out of the award initiation. That's the unit that takes the award, sets it up in Quali, then also gets it set up in Oracle. So we had a loss there. That caused a backlog, a loss of time. About the time we got that unit restaffed, we started losing people out of award negotiation. An award negotiation, typically that is where we have to work with the sponsor because maybe their terms and conditions don't match what we're allowed to do as a state agency. And there's some back and forth there. Right now, we're about six people down, or about 50% down. And we keep on trying to hire individuals, but it's very competitive. And so you know, we remain behind. Now we are catching up, we think we're gonna get there, but this has caused us loss of people like Katie Schneller, the director of OSP, a longtime employee who had a lot of institutional knowledge and experience. Losing these people, they're hard to replace. The good news is we have several excellent candidates for that director position. These are people who come from other universities with similar experience, so we have to catch up there. As you see the growth in volume from 2018 to 2022, it's roughly 33% growth. So Clay Marsh came on as executive director of the Research Corporation back in the fall, replacing Rob Olson. And so one of the things that Clay did was he wanted to figure out how we could address this problem. He talked not only to you, the faculty researchers who were out there, but he also talked with staff in the Office of Sponsored Programs. And speaking with that staff, he got a clear picture of what the challenges were. And he and I have been working together with Katie Stores, to whom that office answers, and thought about what were the different challenges and what can we do to address them. And so the first one was really we need increased communication and to improve user experience, to give people some autonomy over finding out where their awards were. One of the things I'll talk about in a moment is we have coming online a self-serve status check tool where you can work with your college office, your either associate dean for research, research administrator, go into the system and find out where is my award at. What is happening with my award? What challenges am I facing? The next thing that we looked at was how do we streamline processes in terms of thinking about stratification of award, different approaches. Not all awards have to go to award negotiation. Very simple R01 awards, National Science Foundation awards, they can go directly over to AIM. And so we're implementing a procedure now where that is occurring. That should speed up things for those simple awards. 
we, working with Sally Hodder, have a new office focused on clinical trials. So from this point forward, any kind of clinical trial work will go through Sally's office, from proposal to award setup, things like that. And that should streamline processes. The other thing that Clay noted is we were built not to surge capacity, but really we were kind of short-staffed. in a way. And his analogy is when you build a building, you build an elevator not for what is kind of like the average use, surge capacity. What do you need to really get things moving? And one of the challenges, of course, as you're all familiar with this, budgets are tight at WVU. We don't necessarily have the budget to fully staff so that when a surge hits, we're ready to go. So what we're doing is we're working with Clay's office and other offices across campus to think about people that we can pull in at those surge times. So people will be trained. We're piloting this with the Health Sciences Center. We're individuals there in Lana's group can work with OSP and take on some of these responsibilities in time of high demand. So that helps us with that. The situation has really changed with respect to the nature of those jobs and to the field as a whole since COVID. So what we find is that the research administrators that are out there, we're having to come up with higher salaries to recruit those individuals to the university. And it's also no longer a local market. When I talked about losing individuals, we lost people to Berkeley, people to Johns Hopkins. They still live in Morgantown. They're still your neighbors, but they're working at these other institutions at the pay rate for those institutions. So we've really transitioned to a remote world in this research administrative area. So we have to pay market rates that are national, not just local anymore, not just Morgantown. We also have to ensure that the workloads are appropriate. Because if you hire individuals in and they're having to overwork, they're going to burn out quick and you're not going to get the service you need. So we're trying to design things, streamline, remove unnecessary processes so that work was more manageable for those individuals. The other thing we're working on is that the whole process is not just within the research office. Part of it is there, but part of it also goes over into purchasing, procurement, HR, the finance world. And so what we're doing is meeting with people from all those offices, seeing how we can work together to get a more streamlined overall process for not only setting up the awards, but for things like service agreements, subcontracts, where we need to negotiate with a range of other entities. And I can say that you know, we're making significant progress there. Um, Katie Stores has been doing a phenomenal job in trying to catch things up, change the way we do business, and move the office into the self-serve status check tool that I mentioned earlier. This is a temporary solution for award initiation. It will also be for award negotiation. And we are limited, as you well know, by the current quality system. So what we are doing is we've gone into the system. IT has worked very hard with us to try to put in place a way for these research professionals to access the information about where your awards grants are sitting at the moment. So you can check into that and figure it out. We're going to be working with the associate deans for research, the research administrators, and we're training them over the next two weeks. So within two weeks, this should be available for your use. This gives you an idea of what it would look like when it's up there. And so you can look for the award type. You can search it by award action. You'll know who it's with at that point in time. And right now, all the people in sponsored programs in their address line, it gives you a team's contact. So you can reach them through teams if you need to talk to that one individual to find out what is going on with my award. It gives you an idea of how long they've had it, what the status is, when it was completed, when it went into MAP from KC, and then the award number and um, fund number information. And again, this is just a snapshot that IT generated for us to show us how the system will look and work. As we look to the future, the important thing is the new Huron Research Administration System. So this is going to be a giant step forward for us. Right now, we've already begun implementation of the awards module. That's really the OSP piece. So that's where you'll go in, enter your proposal, get the information. The information comes to the university that the award is set up, ready to go. And what we've tried to do 
with the status check is to an intermediate step to where we will be when we have Huron in place. That's going to be about a year. That's about how long it takes to get that module in place. And part of the Huron suite, there will also be conflict of interest, IRB, IACUC, the animal modules. These things will all be working together. And the other thing is they'll be integrating with the electronic systems more directly. Right now, everything is done through manual processes. So your information has to be entered multiple times before it gets into the system. In the future, that will all be electronic. You won't have to worry about that. Um, the website is up now about the Research Connect program. That's where you can go and learn about where things are at with that program. How are we progressing in terms of getting Huron installed at the university? And lastly, there's the campus conversation coming up on Wednesday. Clay will be there, I will be there, and most importantly, Katie will be there to walk you through the different things that are going on to improve the service to the community. And again, we're well aware that things are not good. And we're trying our best to fix things. But I will tell you, it's like a perfect storm. At the same time, we've seen tremendous growth. We've also seen a tremendous loss of personnel. We've seen a change overall in the workforce in that area and the availability of personnel. But I have confidence in the people that we're working with that we're going to get there. So I'm happy to take any questions you have at this time. Hi, thank you so much, Casey Kidd, School of Medicine. This is a whole lot of our struggle as, as junior researchers, especially trying to navigate this sometimes for the first time and then not having that institutional knowledge to fall back on in a lot of cases. I had two questions for you. The first is, when do you anticipate we could start training on Huron as faculty, uh, particularly as those involved with the IRB, but those doing our own research as well? Um, and then secondarily, when does that pay matching or, or pay increase for research administrators and grants managers uh, actually go into effect because we're currently hiring and I would love to have a more competitive offer. Yeah. So we've been working with HR on that issue. I would suggest the starting point for that would be your HR partner. And then going back to your other question, this implementation process includes training of faculty and also test driving. So we'll have faculty focus groups who will work with the new system, see how it's working for them, give us advice on things that maybe are not working as well as they should be. So as we get to the final product, it's in place and it's a better function for the faculty. Thank you. Scott. Uh, hi, Fred. I'm Scott Critchley of Early College. I appreciate you staying for the whole meeting. Uh, apparently the president and Privis didn't find time to stay for the once a month meeting, but hey, happy you're here. Um, I have a question that kind of goes back to things that Travis mentioned. It was also in uh, one of the emails that went out from Ann Barry last week that there's legislation in both houses of the legislature to expand the mission statement of the research corp from simply research to research and economic development. Now, I think a lot of us are going to have some issues with that to start with because, of course, our budget's so bad. We just hired, fired hundreds of people. And of course, I don't want to forget those who like, retired early to save people. Um, good on them. Um, so I. When you take that budget situation, I mean, we already know we're kind of moving in this direction. Like mentioning that Ascend is one of our top three budget priorities asked. It's not research, it's not education, it's Ascend. I don't, I don't think a lot of us really would not understand that. I mean, we, we get that that's going in that direction. But everything you described points out how the research corp is already burdened beyond belief to do what it's already doing. Whether it's in medicine, whether it's in biology, um, how is it possible to expand what it's supposed to be doing to economic development as well as research when everything you're saying is that we can never kind of keep up where we are like right now? Yeah, so, you know, first of all, when we think about the research office, the research corporation, they're, of course, separate entities. Um, most university research offices are called either research and economic development or research and innovation or something like that. And in particular, at land grant universities where they feel the need to connect the university more closely with industry. Of course, part of our land grant mission in West Virginia is how do we help the state change the nature of its economy? And that's an important thing because at the end of the day, the state's economy is not doing well, the state budget's not doing well, but that means our budget's not doing well. So I don't think it's really a change per se. What I think it is 
is creating an ability for industry to work more closely with the university and anything that would occur there would be externally supported. So it really doesn't take away from the internal resources available for the university. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my understanding. Again, not all these programs am I directly related to. I hope that's helpful, Scott. Yes. Okay, uh, Harlan Lee from Senator College. Um, unfortunately, our president and provost has left. And um, so my question is very simple. How difficult, how challenging is it is for a research office to be able to have someone answer yourself, answer your phone call. We call your okay. phone and always nobody answer, never get back. How so, much resource you need? Can you, you know, can you ask the, the president office? So, like many offices, the phone lines have been reduced. But what we have is teams, and we have email. You can always reach me or Katie Stores or any of my associates by email at any time. For the OSP staff, you can reach them anytime on Teams. So there are ways to reach out to us. We, we always call your main phone number list on the website. And I cannot say you never get any back, but 90%, nobody ever, ever get it back. And I can tell you also that we have lost administrative staff due to budget issues. So right now, we have, I think, in all the research office, three administrative staff members. Now, the one line should be answered by one of those individuals. If that's not occurring, I need to know, and I will follow up on that and see why that isn't. But again, I wish you can figure that out, because it's very embarrassing, because you put a number there, say, call this number, and we call. Nobody answer. Nobody get it back. I'm not sure folks here. Whoever called that research office number, did you get the back to you on time or any time? Well, that's something I need to follow up on. That. I'm, many faculty are very upset about that because, you know, research office is one of the office bringing money to WU. Absolutely. And that's a very important office. If WU cannot afford to answer the phone, what we should do? Well, again, I need to follow up on that Highland to figure out why that's not occurring. That should not, there should be someone who's answering the phone at some point. So I'm I apologize hear, for that and I will work that. on that. And I wish, you know, sometime we can call the phone if somebody can answer. Very simple. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you all. We do appreciate your work. That's not the first time I've heard about the phone. We've heard that about emails, and I know you all have been working on that as well. And where it's at, this dashboard is going to help with that because you can connect exactly with the person and not have to call a, a dead number, although I appreciate that that's, it should be answered. So um, thank you for that, um, Fred. We only have one more thing. And um, I thank you all for staying. You're, you're the Senate, Senate warriors. I appreciate you still here. Um, it's time for our election cycle. And um, today, Corey Hunt sent out call for nominees by college for new senators in preparation for elections later this semester. The uh, call for nominees will be open until Monday, February the 19th, so for two weeks. Senate terms last three years. Senators can be elected for two consecutive terms. If you know a colleague, this is a good time uh, to recruit ones you think might be a good fit for Senate um, and to nominate them or encourage them to nominate themselves. We'll be voting in early March and the results will be released in April. Following the call for new senator nominations, we will open nominations for faculty senate chair elect and after that for faculty representative to the board of governors. Our faculty secretary, Dave Hauser, and our faculty representative of state government, Eloise Elliott, still each have one more year on their term, so those positions will not be open for election this year. Any member of the university assembly who has served as a senator in the last three years is eligible to be nominated for the position of chair elect. Faculty can self-nominate or be nominated by a senator. 
Anyone who is interested in running for chair elect can reach out and send an email to our faculty center administrator, Corey Hunt, or to me. Um, we will also accept nominations from the floor for chair elect during the March 4th faculty senate meeting. Candidates will have the opportunity to make a two minute campaign statement at the April 1st, no joke, faculty senate meeting. Ballots will be distributed to senators via Qualtrics during the month of April and results will be announced at the May 6th faculty senate meeting. Regarding the faculty representative to the Board of Governors for which Stan has served for seven years, I think, um, and he is not going to, to run again. <laughs> um, our West Virginia code states that the governing board of the university shall include two faculty representatives serving staggered two-year terms. The Senate Constitution stipulates that one of these members shall be the faculty Senate chair whose term begins in an odd number year. At the moment, that's me. It further stipulates that the second governing board member shall be elected by the entire faculty Senate, elected from full-time faculty with the rank of instructor or above, drawn from either extension or health sciences, and having at least 60% of their time assigned to one of those units. In addition to any submitted nominations, we will accept nominations from the floor from any member of the university assembly. This one's different. Any member of the university assembly can nominate someone at the April 1st Senate meeting. Candidates will have the opportunity to make two minute campaign statements at the May 6th faculty meeting. Ballots will be distributed to senators via Qualtrics or Tall Quicks immediately following the May meeting. Uh, results of the election will be announced by the faculty secretary as soon as practical after the completion of the votes is tallied, are tallied. Are uh, there any questions about the nomination or election process for me at this time? Is there any new business? Uh, oh. Also, this is a juicy yes, sir. one. Well, so it's probably, I'm not sure if anyone's here Please to Please introduce yourself. Oh, hi, Dan Totske of Really College. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's here to answer this, but last week it was uh, reported to the legislature that we have a $24 million budget shortfall. Uh, and I had could have asked this earlier, but I wanted to see if it was covered. Uh, in addition to, I think it was a uh, 5 million for PEIA and 14 for the 5% pay increase. Just wanted to know if this is a new 24 million, uh, leftover 24 million, are we all getting fired again? Uh, sort of what, <laughs> should I buckle up? I, so, I mean, if, if, if Mark would like to address it, we are going to get a full budget presentation okay. from Paula Congelio and from Mark in at our March meeting. I will make sure. About I this year and about next year. But if, are, is, does that work for you or would you like Mark to come up? I mean, that's fine. I can, that's, yeah, I was just, I wanted to bring it up. So if it's gonna, I mean, eh, comment on it or, okay. yeah. No, that is not new. Okay. Um, that is the 24 million that we were dealing with last year. Okay. So that was what was referenced. Cool. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, not great, but mm -hmm. confirmed. Thank you. Language is funny. If there is no objection, we will adjourn. Was that an objection, Mark? No. Oh, okay. There being no objection, we are adjourned.